watch what's going on in the world around us this past week or two, it's become more and more obvious that uh, we live in really desperate and changing times. The, the cultural wars that evangelicalism claims to have fought for the last 30 years have been thoroughly lost. The structure that was our nation culturally, economically, and politically has disintegrated. And now you're watching the collapse of that. And frankly, a lot of the people that have promoted that within the safety of the structure now are discovering that they too will be swept away when that structure isn't there to protect them. And as you, as you see those kind of things taking place, the future uh, seems so uncertain. And you, you, you oftentimes want to give up. And I said to you before, even though the culture wars have been lost and things will change and have changed and are changed, your hope hasn't changed. This week, when, when this morning actually, when, when we got the word about Cheyenne's home going, of course the last few days it's been pretty obvious that it was close and the difficulty and the struggle there. You know, you have, you have desperate times nationally and then you have them personally. And that brings it home to a very personal kind of a thing. And as I think about that, I thought I'd just need to remind you you know, in the midst of that kind of thing, there needs to be an adult in the room. You watch what goes on in our culture and you think, it, won't some grown-up stand up and say, wait a minute, wake up? In the midst of personal things and the, the, the bearing of, of the burdens of, of the daily life, uh, we need an adult to stand up and give some direction. And when I think about that, I'm reminded of the fact that that's exactly what you and I as believers are called to be, as an adult. Did I tell you Romans 8? Okay, at least I told you where to turn. The book of Proverbs says that, um, Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed. That's true, personally. It's true nationally. The Bible says that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. I don't care what the nation is, what the culture is, you, what the individual is, you can't get away from that. You turn your back on God's Word, and you invite destruction. It's like an owner's manual. You don't, you don't, don't want to change the oil because the owner's manual says to change it every now 5,000 miles, or whatever it is. You say, I think I'll, I won't do it for 100,000. You bear the consequences of that. Because the people that created and built the automobile knew how it needed to be maintained. The creator of the, of the universe, the one who set up the culture that we live in and, and the structure we live in, he knows how it's to be designed. And when you turn your back on that, you wind up with the destruction that comes from that, the foolishness that comes from that. And if righteousness exalts a nation, sin is a reproach to any people. It's that nationally, it's that personally. And that's why somebody needs to stand up as an adult that understands what truth is and say, hey, here's the truth. Here's reality. Here's what God says. That's the purpose of the church, the body of Christ. Our purpose is not to go out and to, to do all the things you see people doing. You, you look at the cultural things, the people that, that, that rise up, uh, you know, there's a, there's a disturbance in, in, in a community, and the first people that get on the television and talk about it are preachers. But they never point you to the Word of God. Now you just, whoever your heroes are, think about that. They don't point you to God's Word, they point you to some economic, social, or political answer, but not the truth of God's Word, which is the answer. And when you do that, you say, okay, <laughs> there goes foolishness. And when you turn your back on God's Word, you get the result of that. When I say you turn your back on God's Word, I mean you turn your back on God's Word rightly divided. I was talking to some people just uh, yesterday in the Bible conference up in Michigan, and someone asked me, said, well, uh, Islam, is the Antichrist, the big thing today in evangelicalism is that the Antichrist is going to be a Muslim. And that tells you how, how smart evangelicalism is about the Bible. The Antichrist will not be a Muslim. Okay? Forget that. 
If you want to know what's going to happen to Islam before the coming of Christ, you go back and get our studies in Obadiah that we taught several years ago right here. And the book of Obadiah tells you what's going to happen to Islam. And it's not going to be a factor. It's not going to be the religion of the Antichrist. But people say, well, how can it be absorbed into Baal worship? The modern manifestation, by the way, of Baal worship is, the, is Romanism, the Roman Catholic system. That's if you take Baal worship in the Bible, take all its characteristics and lay them out on the board. We've done this for you. A study in the bookstore called uh, Satan's Church goes through all that information. And you say, well, who is this? You can identify it, Mystery of Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots and Abominations of the Earth, in a religious system. It's fascinating that in 1930, 31, a famous Roman Catholic historian wrote a very compelling book about the five heresies of, of Catholicism, and he claims and says, and the official position of the Roman Catholic system is that Islam is a heresy of Christianity. It's a Christian heresy. It's a break-off. You think, uh, think about Jehovah Witnesses. That's a, they claim to be Christians, but it's a heresy. Mormonism claimed to be Christians, but it's a heresy. And he say, he's saying that Islam, because Muhammad was raised among some heretical Christians, historians, the Aryans, and, and, and the, the, the contact that he, that, that he had in his upbringing and so forth. And they, they, that's their position. Now, you can agree with them or not agree with them. My point is that they look at it. Their position is we can welcome them in as erring brothers. You follow that? You watch the ecumenical movement where they're going to bring the Protestants back in and so forth. They look at it as though as long as you just are able. So they look at it like being able to assimilate them back into Holy Mother Church. <laughs> and there are some events that will take place before the, the tribulation period that will bring that to pass. Now, that's what God's Word says about those things. And you say, well, wow, <laughs> that's... Getting distracted about that, brother down in Texas, uh, Warren Letzman, he, he, he always says, um, don't worry about the tribulation, you ain't going to be there. So what are you worried about that stuff anyway? If it's not, if it's not something you're going to be, so well, I'm in, if it's not something that, we, that you're going to be a part of, it's really irrelevant to your life. Now, it might be something you'd like to know about, be interested in finding out about, but really, since you aren't going to be there, why aren't you going to be there? Our earnest expectation and hope is to be out of here before that. The dispensation of grace has to end before those things begin. And if you aren't going to be there, then whether it is or it isn't, right or wrong, it, will, it won't make any difference to you because you're going to be in the heavens doing something else. So I say, wow, that's interesting. You know what that is? That's thinking like an adult. Now, the purpose of a local church is not to be a political institution, an economic institution, a social moving institution. It's to be the pillar and the ground of the truth. Amen. We're to be the source of the truth in a community. And as we stand for the truth, as we propagate the truth, the will of God is that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So we gather to, to, to edify the saints so that they then can go out and do the work of the ministry of taking the gospel out into the world about us and proclaiming it and sharing that with a, with a lost and dying world. You do that by the proclamation of the gospel backed up by lives that demonstrate the transforming power of that gospel. And as we go out and do that and carry on our ministry that way, where people, when they look at us and they see us and they see the truth, they see truth in action. Listen, God's Word will take care of itself. You don't need to defend God's Word. You just need to let it out. There's an old illustration about, you know, the, the guy said, uh, the Word of God is like a lion. You put him in a cage and somebody throws sticks at him and rocks at him, and how do, how do you defend him? You don't defend him. You open the door of the cage, he'll defend himself. <laughs> and what you discover is if you preach God's Word, if you teach God's Word, if you share God's Word with people, it will affect the people you're sharing it with. It has that power. We forget that when we don't, when we don't see that power of God working in our own lives because we believe it. And instead of it being the transforming power in our life, it just becomes a ritual of things, and consequently we, don't, we, we forget its power in the lives of others when we proclaim it. So that when you see that, the transforming power of God's Word energizing your life, then you realize and you remember its power to do the same in others' lives. 
our function as a local, as, as an assembly of believers, our function as, a, as the body of Christ in a local area like this is to be the pillar and the ground of the truth, to take God's truth and put it on display so the world can, can be influenced by it, hear it, have it available. There needs to be an adult in town. <laughs> okay, one of the prophets back in the Old Testament came to, to uh, uh, the king of Israel and he said, is there a man of God in town? <laughs> well, I think about that a lot. Is there truth in town? Well, there is. And it's our privilege to be a part of that. In Romans chapter 8, it, you got Romans 8? All right, hold on to that and come over to Ephesians chapter 1. I should have told you two passages. I'm sorry. Romans 8 and Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God of, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That's what God's doing today. He's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Everything God has for you is yours already up front in your possession, in your safe. The door's locked, can't get out. There's no more needs to be added. You are complete in him. What a wonderful thing. You start out at the top of the ladder. You're not at the bottom trying to climb up. He tells you what some of these spiritual assets are. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. If you ever wondered if you have any significance in life, any purpose and meaning in life, before the foundation of the world, God chose us in him. He, he, he determined to form the church, the body of Christ, out of people who trust his son. In the wisdom of God, when the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Chapter 2, he says, by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. Sometimes we emphasize the fact that it's by grace and grace alone. But that verse doesn't say that. That verse says it's by grace through faith. God's part is the grace. Your part is the faith. Faith is the only thing you can do without doing anything because it's trusting what someone else did for you. So you do the sinning, God does the saving. Christ does the paying, you do the believing. And the only thing you can do to have God's grace in your life is to believe it. But you have to believe it because the only response grace will accept is faith. And without faith, grace doesn't operate. It's by grace, it's by faith that it might be of grace. So, before the world began, he planned the church, the body of Christ, and he planned a place for you and me when we trust his son in that. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That you should be. That's who you be. That's who you are. You need to relax and appreciate who God already has made you and His Son because you live day by day out of your identity, your concept of who you are. And your sense of identity needs to be that in Christ you are holy and without blame before Him in love. Having predestinated us. Now, that word predestinate means your destiny, you see that in the word, is prefixed. This is talking about saved people. You get all kind of theology going on, you know, about predestination, election, people getting saved because God chose. That's a bunch of theology. That's not Bible. Alex has been teaching about that in the morning se first session. If you're in Christ today, you're saved. You have been predestinated. Your destiny is fixed ahead of time. Now notice what your destiny is. Predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. It's the good pleasure of God's will to have prefixed your destiny and your destiny is to be adopt the adoption of children. Now the idea of adoption in the Bible is very important. It's different from the concept of human adoption. We have people here who have adopted children into their family. You take someone, take a child, 
born in someone else's, to some other birth parent, but you bring them into a relationship and put them into your family as though they are your children. And they get, you give them the complete status of being your child. That is an adoption in the Bible. In the, if you look over, you're in Ephesians, look at the, just go to the left, two chapters, Galatians 4. In Galatians 4, he describes the issue of adoption in the Bible. Now I say that an heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed to the Father. Here's a child. He is your birth child. You are his birth parents. Okay? He's a child. He's, he's going to have the whole inheritance. But there's a time in his life when he's considered a child. He's not an adult yet. He's not an adult until verse 2, until the time appointed of the father. <laughs> Have you dads had your Galatians 4 conversation with your children? <laughs> well, you need to. You need to know your children so well that you, when they come to the place where they move into their majority and their adulthood, you can declare that for them. Don't let them guess about it. Don't let them wonder about it. And when they, they, they there comes a point and that point, in, in Jewish life, it's called a bar mitzvah. In, in the Bible, that point of adoption is when the father declares his child to be now an adult, to be lord of all. That is to be able to go out and exercise lordship over his inheritance, to run the business of the father. Verse number six, because you're sons. Now there's, when it says sons there, He's talking about you're an adult now. Sometimes we call that sonship. That's not a Bible term, sonship isn't, but it's a Bible concept. When you put that word ship on the, on the, end, of, uh, on the end of something like fellowship or relationship stuff, so that's the way in English you say you're talking about a, a status. When you're in the sonship, you, you're in the status of being an adult in the family. I hear preachers say sometimes, say, well, you know, when, God, when, you, when you got saved, God adopted you into his family. No, God, you were born into the family of God. A child is a born one. You're regenerated. God gives you his life. He implants his life in you and gives you a new newness of life. That's how you get into the family, become a child of God. But there is a purpose that God has that his children would then be are predestinated to an adoption, to a being put in a position of full-grown sons, manifest, declared to be Lord of the inheritance. When you're the Lord of all, that means you run everything. Okay, You understand what the business of the Father is, and now you can go out and run it. Now, Dad isn't going to put you in charge of a business if you don't know what you're doing. Okay, that, that's why it's, it, there's a time appointed. You're under tutors and governors. The tutor tells you what to do. A governor tells you what not to do. You're run by that. And in the passage, that's the law. People say, give me a law and I'll stop sin. No, you won't. That's a vain boast. But that's what they do. A, a, a governor, give me a law and, I, and tell me what to do and I'll do it. Give me a law and tell me what not to do and I won't do it. You liar. I tell you what to do and you don't do it, and I tell you what not to do and you do it anyway. You know that. That's, the pro that's what people use the law for, though, is we we'll stop sin and we'll serve God. The problem isn't the law. The problem's you. Romans 8 says that the law is weak through your flesh because your flesh can't keep it. Chapter 3, verse 10 of Galatians, he tells you the problem with the law isn't, isn't the law, it's you. Chapter 3, verse 10, For as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the law to do them. You know what your problem is? You already haven't kept all things. You say, well, I'll, per I'll have perfect obedience for the future, Brother Rick. What about your past? You know how many times Adam and Eve had to sin to get it thrown out of the garden? I'll give you a hint. One time. Eat one grape. I think about that. My wife and I, we eat, we eat a lot of watermelons and grapes this time of the year. <laughs> about a watermelon every two days and a bunch of grapes about every day. And I was standing there in the sink, and she makes me wash them before I eat them. I, I read a thing the other day. The greatest 
cure for being a vegan is to get a bag of grapes and find a spider in them. You ever done that? Listen, you'd never find a spider in a pound of bacon. Okay? I'll eat those grapes, and I think about Adam and Eve sometime. I think, you know, Eve brought that to him and gave it to him, and I can understand. I love grapes. I don't know how I got into that. I, that was my rabbit trail to nowhere. <laughs> I'm come back. The point is, one cent is all it takes, and you've got more than that. That's why tutors and governors don't work, because you can't stop sin, and you can't produce righteousness that God accepts. That's what people try to use the law for, use religion for. Paul says you don't need that. You have life in Christ. You have God's grace to give it to you. But there comes a point in time when that Father declares you to be a son. And if son, verse seven, verse, uh, Galatians 4, 6, because sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now that's an important concept. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Listen, you and I as members of the body of Christ are looked on by the Father not as servants, but as sons. Not as children, but as adults. That's, the perp that's what he has predetermined our destiny to be. Where he will put us on display before the universe as his full-grown sons, able, capable of functioning as Lord of his inheritance. Now, come back with me to Romans 8. Because there is a time in which that adoption is going to become a reality. Romans chapter 8, verse number 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And ain't that the truth? You know that because you live it. Some of you sit there right now and you're shifting in your chair because your back hurts. <laughs> you have heartaches, difficulties. The whole creation groans and travails together in pain until now. We know it by our experience. We know it by God's Word. In that passage, to me, the two words that are most important are the last two, until now. We know by our experience, we know by the truth of God's Word, that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain until now. Somebody says, well, that's not true of believers. Well, then the verse, next verse says, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. We groan within ourselves. So believers are not exempt from this. Waiting, verse 23, what are we waiting for? For the adoption, the thing that we've been predestinated to. What is the adoption? To wit, the redemption of our body. Now, what is the redemption of your body? That's the resurrection. That takes place at an event we call, generally call, the rapture, our catching away to be with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, the twinkling of an eye, this mortal, this body that's subject to death but isn't dead yet, it must put on immortality. This corruptible, somebody's died, their body's molding in the grave, must put on immortality. Paul says it in 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, the Lord, This I say unto you by the word of the Lord, that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the, with the shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive may be caught up. There's some people who are alive and some people who are dead. When the Lord comes, he resurrects the dead people. He changes the living people so that your body is changed like unto his glorious body. 
at that moment of the resurrection of the redemption of your body. And at that moment, you, you're placed on public display. Hold your hand here and come with me to Galatians, I'm um, sorry, Philippians chapter 3. This is one of these woohoo moments. When Paul says, that looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God in our Savior, here's something that is, fills the heart of a believer with expectation. Here's what we're expecting. Here's what we're looking for. Here's what our hope is. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven. Everything about you and me is in heaven. It's not always heavenly, but it's in heaven. We're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Our hope, our destiny, our calling, our conversation, everything about us. That's why Paul says in chapter 3 of Galatians, set your affections on things above, not on things to the earth. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior. A Pauline outlook an outlook like the Apostle Paul is to always be looking, always be expecting, always have that earnest expectation of our Savior from heaven. Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Now some of you don't think you have a vile body yet. You get older, you will. But some of you young people, you know, you, I, I, remember, I, used, I can remember being young. It wasn't that many decades ago. <laughs> and I remember when I was just a teenager, and, and I, re, I remember a brother telling me, he said, you know, you look at, you look at you, people, the glamorous people, the beautiful people in life, and he said, you know how to get over thinking about the beautiful people in life? You know, the people in People magazine and on the show, all the, the hoity-torty ones. He said, just think about them the morning after they ate some rotten pizza. And their head is hung over the tub and their other ends hung over the other thing. You get the picture. Think about whoever it is you think is the greatest man or woman, and just see them in the kind of condition you've been in at times when things weren't going so well with your digestive system. You want to think about your vile body? You can get over thinking that you're, so, you're, you know, you're just so superior by thinking about that condition. This body that will fail you, it really demonstrates your humiliation He'll change that vile body, this mortal, this immortality. Must be changed. We shall all be changed. It may be fashioned like his glorious body. He's going to literally give you a body fashioned. Everybody wants to walk the runway and be in fashion. He's going to fashion you with a body, be the best you ever looked the best you ever could look, like unto his glorious body. And we usually think, you know, well, we won't have any more baldness and bifocals and bridge work and bunions and bulges. and Just get rid of the bulges would be enough for most of us. But it's far more than that, because look at the rest of that verse. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things to himself. The teaching about subduing all things. What's he talking about? Making, making him Lord of all. Subduing all things. All those positions of government and authority and all the activity in the universe, bringing it under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right down by that verse, Colossians 1, verse 16 to the end of the, to, to, to 20, and you'll get it. Ephesians 1, verse 10 to 22, you'll get it. In the dispensation of the fullness of times, it's the Father's will to make all things take all things in heaven and earth and make, put them all under the headship of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Make him the head of all things. And that all things there is not just talking about the, you know, the trees and the birds and the animals. It's talking about the government of the universe. Make him Lord of all creation, heaven and earth. 
and he's going to give you a body that's fashioned with a capacity to serve him in the realm of the heavens. That's why it's going to be a glory, glorious body, a body that will share in the glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Christ is our life shall appear, then it shall we appear with him in glory. We're going to share. We're going to be the vehicle through which his glory is manifested, the, the special effervescence of the character of the Lord Jesus Christ will be shed throughout the universe through the body, the vehicle that manifests his life. I read that and I think, oh man, that's, you know what that is? That's superlative. That's good. That's a hope and expectation worth having. That's what being an adult in God's family is about. And there's a moment, which I had to teach yesterday without a chalkboard, it was a pain. <laughs> Jesus Christ dies on the cross, ascends into heaven, the Holy Spirit comes on the apostles, the fall of Israel takes place, the Lord Jesus Christ saves Saul of Tarsus, makes him Paul the apostle, and you have the church, the body of Christ, in here where we are today. One day, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back, going to catch the church, the body of Christ away, take us into the heavenly places. That event right there is the, is the beginning of your adoption. Then the tribulation period over here, Christ comes back, sets his kingdom up on the earth, having already established it in the heavens. That outline tells you something. When he says here, we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. This time over here is a time when sorrow and sighing flee away. They aren't anymore. You say, well, why are they still here now? Because you aren't over there. Why aren't we over there? Because we're still over here. As long as this is being formed, as long as the dispensation of grace is in effect, and the church, the body of Christ, is being formed, you know what he does? He postpones that. That's called prophecy. This is something in the Bible that God has been speaking since the mouth of, by his mouth of all the holy prophets, since the world began, back here with Adam. This thing in here is called the mystery. This is the preaching of Jesus Christ, S-E-C-R-E, something like that. It's hard to think, talk, and write at the same time and spell things correctly, okay? Sorry. <laughs> this is the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. This thing is not that thing. This program interrupted that program right back over here. And when it did, it, this program is postponed so this program can be in effect as long as this program is going on the whole creation waits for that. So the answer to why we groan and travail along with creation now is because the day of creation's deliverance is over here. We aren't there yet. This is not brain surgery, folks. This is simple, right division of God's Word. This is simple dispensational Bible study. All that is is a timeline upon which you describe what God's doing. That's all dispensational Bible study is designed to do. But that's the answer. That's adult thinking about what's going on. You say, well, when does injustice get taken care of? That's what this is about. When does poverty get taken care of? That's what this is about. When does the environment get redeemed? That's what this is about. When, do all the th when does war and strife? That's what this is about. That's what we are waiting for, what creation is waiting for. Why are they still waiting? Because he's still forming the body of Christ. It is going to take up here and function in the heavens. You know who decides when that's over with? Your father does. <laughs> now go back to verse 18. So here's, look. The future reality that God has predestinated us to is that he's going to have us share in the position of, the son, of his son. We have this adoption where we're going to be placed on public display as 
adults in the family of God who are capable of exercising lordship over his creation. That future reality of being put on public display as full-grown adults in the family of God. And by the way, that's always been God's desire, is to have adults running his creation. You remember Isaiah chapter 14, maybe? It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? That's how Satan became Satan. He was Lucifer, the light bearer. Job 38 talks about him with his strong right arm. He was to hold up the light. Who's the light in the Bible? Our gospel be hid as hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of, the, of, 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 the, uh, of God should shine unto them. For God that called darkness, light to shine out of darkness has shined in our face to give the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He's the, light, the life that lights every man. He's the light. And Lucifer's original purpose was to lead creation in, the, in an exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, God the Son, God the Father finds every delight he has in his Son. Colossians 1, he says, in him the Father has given him all preeminence. I've said it many times, if God the Father believes that if you could see in his Son what he sees in his Son, you'd love him like he does. He just wants you to see the value, the treasure that is in his Son. Adam and Eve, Lucifer, Son of the Morning, lead creation in this intelligent purpose of understanding the understanding, wisdom, and knowledge that God's put in it to exalt his Son. He failed. He turned it on himself. He fell. He said, I think I deserve it. And he decided he would be the father. And he goes to Adam and Eve when God creates man. You remember what he created when he created Adam? The last verse in Luke chapter 3, he created Adam, the son of God. He created Adam to be a son. He created Adam to join with him in the reigning, the rulership, the dominion over his creation and to function in creation with an intelligent understanding of what the father's doing to understand the Father's will, to work with the Father, and to delight in what the Father delighted in. And who does he delight in? He delights in his Son. And Adam and Eve, instead of following the Father, they followed a bogus father. John 8, Jesus tells the religious leaders of Israel you have, you, that you are of your father, the devil. Satan decides to be the counterfeit father. The seed of the woman that God makes the promise to becomes the seed of Abraham. God calls Abraham out of Egypt. I'm sorry, the seed of Abraham, Israel, out of Egypt. And in Exodus 4.22, what does he call them? He says, out of Egypt have I called my firstborn son. That's why Romans 9, he says that to Israel pertains the adoption. God has the plan to redeem Israel and make them his son, to adopt, the, give them an ado the adoption. Use them to exalt his purpose and his son. Give them the will to do it right here. Then he forms the church, the body of Christ. And he says, I've got some sons I never told anybody about. And he makes us his sons. Because he's going to use us to exalt his son's purpose in the heavenly places. Listen, the essence of Bible Christianity is the fact that God the Father has one purpose in his creation, and that is to exalt his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the head of all things. He's going to do it through two, in two realms, heaven and earth, and he's going to use two agencies to do it, Israel and the body of Christ. But that's the one purpose. So here we are in the dispensation of grace. Here we are in the in-between, waiting for the adoption. And by the way, Romans 8, verse 23, you see when it says, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body? 
When you abandon a King James Bible, you abandon some things in your language that you can't get back. People, they like to just throw out. We don't go around often. We do say to wit, but we don't do it too often. But that word wit, we say he has a sharp wit. You ever use it like that? That word wit means the ability, the natural skill to understand something and to make something of it. When you understand where you are in the program of God, you grasp what this is about. Well, how are you going to do that? We'll go back up to verse 18 because he just gave them some information so that they could say, to wit, the rede- oh, we know what the adoption is. It's the redemption of our body. So when you get to verse 23, you would know what the adoption is. Verse, 20, verse 18. For I reckon that the suffering of this... No, I reckon. You know what that is. Somebody says Paul was a southerner. He used these southern expressions. <laughs> I had a friend in Texas. He said he might have been a southerner, but he wasn't a Texan. Why is that? He said, well, in whatsoever state I am there, and I'm content. No Texan would say that. <laughs> so you guys going to Texas, you, you know, just remember that. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. He said, this stuff going on right now is not worthy to be compared. It's not worth spending time worrying about when you think about what's coming out there. Now that's the mindset. When the SNL gang situation, circumstances come along and start beating on you, you say, the sufferings of this present time aren't worth my attention compared to that stuff out there. Now, if you don't have anything to compare it with, that's all you got. But for an intelligized believer who's got some adult understanding, he understands what's going on out there. I've got, an, I've got a hope that makes this Look like just a temporary bunch of lint on my sleeve. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You see back in verse 17 when he says, if we suffer with him, with Christ, the way you suffer with Christ, and the sufferings, by the way, are in verse 18, are the sufferings that we have in this present time. The dispensation that we live in is, a pre- is the present time is suffering. The characteristic is suffering because the deliverance comes over here, and he's going to tell you about that in the next couple of verses. Creation is waiting to be delivered into the glorious liberty of the children of God that takes place over here. But right now that's being postponed, so this present suffering. So when you suffer, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be such a shock. The curse is random, folks. Listen, when some... Older person, yesterday at the Bible conference in, in, in Michigan, a brother there, Brother Combs, showed me a picture that he took in 1981 of, I was, of me. I was a handsome young guy with black hair. <laughs> Pastor Wilson Watkins, Brother Ron, uh, Russell Shepard, and Brother Combs, some other people, and Brother William Fleming. Now, you won't remember Pastor Fleming. He's been with the Lord. He was 91 years old when that picture was taken. He didn't die until he was about 109. And he was, a, he was a romping, stomping grace preacher until he went to be with the Lord. And I'm looking at that picture thinking, wow. We all look, Brother Russell Shepard, he, he looked, I said, you look so young. He said, because I was. <laughs> he had hair. He didn't have any hair now. He said, well, you, got, you had hair too, but it's all white now. I said, yeah, that's true. Whether you're young or you're old, er, the reality is this is where we live. And this present suffering, Paul said, I, here's how you think about it. When you suffer with Christ, the suffering in this chapter is not the sufferings of Christ 
Yea, all they that live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The sufferings here are not the things that you suffer because you sow to the flesh and you're dumb and stupid and do crazy things in life. Now you suffer for that, probably more than anything. Peter says when you suffer, suffer as a Christian, not as a worldly. But you get that. Occasionally you get some of the sufferings of Christ because you live godly in Christ Jesus. But most of the time it's these sufferings. Somebody call them undeserved sufferings. I, that's not really true because we live in a fallen creation. We're a part of it. But it's the things that come upon you just because we live in this period of present suffering. So I reckon that the, and the way you suffer with Christ is you approach them the same way he did. When Jesus Christ looked at Calvary, what did he say? Who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. He said, there's something out there in the future that's going to be accomplished through this. I'll focus on that. And this just something. The mindset that got the Lord Jesus Christ through all of the sufferings was the glory, the joy that was set before him. And whose joy was that? That was the joy of his father. The delight of his Father. I love that verse over in Hebrews 10 that quotes Psalm 40, where the Lord Jesus Christ says, O God, I come to do thy will, and a body thou hast prepared for me. I come to do thy will. The psalmist that he quotes, when he says, In the volume of the book is written of me, I come to do thy will. The psalmist says, In the volume of the book is written of me, I delight to do thy will. When the Lord Jesus Christ came to do the Father's will, he didn't just go, oh, I'll do it just because you told me to do it. <laughs> that's how your kids do, your, do, 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 you know. That's how you do. He said, I delight. This is what my Father wants done. This is my Father's business, and I delight in it. I've got some joy. Why? Because it's my Father's will, and I understand. I know what it is, and I understand it, and he gives me the privilege of participating in it. And I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart because it, I haven't understood. I've entered into my Father's will. It has become the joy and rejoicing of my heart. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time aren't worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. I've entered into the, my Father's will. I understand my Father's heart. I know what's going on. I am an adult. You see verse 14, Romans 8, 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are they're the sons. How do you get led by the Spirit? People say, well, God shows you this sign over there and gives you this sign. That's a bunch of hooey, and you know it. Don't be superstitious. Most people, when they talk about God leading them, are, they, they turn into a bunch of superstitious pagans. God leads you through His Word. He guides you through his counsel. That's always the way he did it. And when the Spirit of God, when you take the Word of God and allow the Spirit of God that wrote the Word to instruct your mind, inform your mind, and then you, you, you work in you because you believe it. Verse 15, for as many, for we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You remember Galatians, he said that. The Spirit of God that's going to resurrect you over here and produce that public display of adoption in the future out there, you've got that Spirit of God living in you right now. And that Spirit of God living in you right now, when you walk in the Spirit, which is what Romans 8 is all about, when you mind the things of the Spirit, when you let God's Word be the guiding principle in your mind, and you let God's Word work in you that believe, work effectually in you that believe, when you walk in the, under the leadership of the Spirit of God, you allow the, Spirit of, the, the Word of God to be the control, the, giving you the mind of Christ. When that happens, you have the privilege now of putting on display the reality that you'll put on display out there. 
I love Romans 6, 13. Paul tells you, he tells you how you're, you're dead to sin, you're alive unto God. And then he says, here, let not sin reign over... Well, look at Romans 6, you're there in Romans. I, I quote it to you and you're sitting there half asleep, you don't get it. Romans 6, verse, uh, verse 11. Likewise, reckon also, you also yourselves dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Here's how you ought to live. Sin is not to be the source of, your fun of the functioning in your life. The life of Christ is. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, which you, you, which, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of, right, of unrighteousness unto sin, your members, the parts of your body, be careful little hands what you, what you touch, be careful little eyes what you see, be careful little feet where you go. That's what that verse is talking about. Don't yield the members of your body. Determine that you're going to present your body a living sacrifice. Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to honor you with the members of my body. Yield yourselves unto God. Watch as those that are alive from the dead. That's a living sacrifice. You're, can, you're to live now as though you're alive from the dead. What happens when you're alive from the dead? The adoption, the redemption of your body, the presentation out here, put him on display. You know what you do now? You manifest them in our mortal bodies. That's a high calling, folks. That's walking like an adult. Now go back to Romans 8, verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. That's what creation's waiting for, is this thing right over here. When all, that, all, the, all the bondage of corruption is taken away. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So there's a, there's a waiting now for this future release that's going to come when Christ comes back over here and delivers creation from the bondage of corruption. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, not only they, but ourselves also, which are the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Verse 24. For we are saved by hope. Now that's not saved from hell and the lake of fire. That's saved in the context, from the misery and the suffering and the travailing and the groaning and the pain that's caused by that. When the CNS gang comes along and starts attacking, and that hopeless desperation, that, uh, that, that helplessness, when you get to that breaking point in life where you, you know, you're overworked and you're outside of the limits of your, 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 your capacities and that impossible expectations are on you and that grinding stress of a, of a lingering illness or whatever it is, when all that stuff comes, you have a hope. You have a confident expectation. And that hope saves you from the despair. Suffering is assured. Misery is optional. But hope that seen is not hope, for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? But if we do hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. How do you see something you can't see? That's what faith is. When you understand what's going on here, you know what, you've got a hope. And you know what that hope does? It saves you from the destructive despair. It saves you from saying, what's the use? It saves you from it all just being a hole in the ground. Chapter 15, verse 13. Now the God of hope. Isn't that a wonderful title? In a world filled with despair and confusion, 
to have a God of hope. That's the difference between the God of the Bible and every other religion you have ever find. The God of hope fill you. Paul talks about being filled. He's talking about having it grip you so much that it controls you. With all joy and peace, watch, in believing. Where you are today, are you filled with joy and peace? Think about that. If the curse reached in and snatched away the most precious person in your life, would you be filled with joy and peace? How do you get filled with joy and peace? In believing. That you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> now you know what abounding is. It just comes out of you and you can't even stop it. You're abounding in expectation. What? In that earnest expectation of that deliverance. But not just deliverance of that adoption. Of that redemption of our body and being, being put in the position of being sharing in his headship and Lord of all, Lord of Lord, Lord of all. There's something out there. God implants into the heart of his people as they believe God's word that joy and peace, that expectation of future glory the future glorification of His Son that you get to participate in. You know what we need? We need some adults in the room that understand that, that stand in it, and that make other people know about it. Who know how to demonstrate what life looks like when you cherish what the Father cherishes above everything else. When you treasure the Lord Jesus Christ above everything. When you value Him, His will, His purpose, His life above all else. The Bible says God has given us all things richly to enjoy. We've been talking about that in Ephesians 4 about taking life and using it the way God intended it to be used. But there's a richness in all those things when you do it. Cherishing His will, His plans. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, Paul says. Having your life filled with the fruits of who you are in Christ. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness under the praise and, which are by Jesus Christ under the praise and glory of God. When people see your life and they see Christ in your life, that is, and see, we make, we make cliches out of that. When they watch you make decisions in your business life, in your personal life, in your in all in your record in your life when they see you making decisions based on God's word because you cherish that more than anything else your attitudes and your actions demonstrate his attitude his actions you put on display that transforming power of that gospel message you become the adult in the room That's a high calling, folks. In all of the turmoil that's been going on, can I tell you that that's the key for you and for me? When Cheyenne went to be with the Lord this morning, give me that thing, I pulled it a couple of weeks ago, we put in the bulletin 
a testimony from her. If you've ever wondered why we teach your children sound doctrine, is because the curse of sin is random. It can hit a 15-year-old like, like it hits a 50-year-old. Cheyenne was, she, she was 18 when she went to bear the Lord today, but she started fighting cancer when she was 15. When people ask questions about a young, young person like that having such a deadly disease, somebody put, put, here's a post off of her Facebook. Somebody said, I, I'll never understand why bad things happen to Christians who love the Lord. Now see, that's a completely ignorant believer, if they're a believer. That's the common complaint. I'm better than God. I know more than God. I wouldn't let that happen because I'm better than God. God let it happen and He's not good as me. That's a common thing. Now listen to an adult response. Unfortunately, because we live in a fallen world, even though we believe in our Savior, that doesn't mean we're kept from the evils in the world that we cause by our sin. The only reason I am the person that I am today is because of the hope I have in our Lord. He saves our souls from this world, not our bodies. That's an adult in a child's body. That's an adult in the room that says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time aren't worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in me. That's the privilege you have of having an adult in the room with you to put on display the truth of God's grace. Thank God for that. Go be the adult in the room where you live, will you? And let it be because you're filled with joy and peace in believing. If you're here today and you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ exclusively as your Savior, that hope can't be yours because it's not for you. Outside of Christ, the only hope you have is, is hell. The only outlook you have is hell. The hope you have is that you can be saved. You can pass from death to life simply because you rely exclusively on what Christ did for you. You don't go anywhere. You don't move a muscle. You don't pray. You don't make deals. God looks at your heart and He says, I want to see your faith resting in my Son. In the quietness and stillness of your heart right where you are, you make that choice and God will save you. That's the deal. That's how you become an adult. Then you get in the book you found out what God already did for you. Go be the adult in the room, will you? Father, we thank you this morning for life in Christ. We thank you for the testimony of your grace through us. In our midst, we thank, we thank you for the privilege of having watched you live and work through Cheyenne. We pray for her family, her mom and her dad, her brother, and all the other family that stands around for the testimony that will be had for the memorials for her. But Heavenly Father, may we have a lasting takeaway from this by having that commitment for us to be the adults in the room you've called us and privileged and equipped us to be in Christ's name.